Is there some kind of threshold dose where you go from having a kind of loosening effect that could also enhance cognition to a dose where you get some confusion or the thought disorder that you associate with psychotic experience? Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. My name is Jesse Lawler. I am your host and this is the 129th episode of this podcast dedicated to the ongoing betterment of your brain, my brain, all our brains by any and all means at our collective disposal. This is an episode that's been a long time coming. People have been asking for this one forever and I kind of held off on it for a long time. Not sure how much I wanted to take the content of the show in the direction of psychedelics, which are not even in the loosest definition considered to be under the nootropics umbrella, but they certainly are interesting and have a lot of relevance to the brain and there's much to be learned from them whether one is a personal fan or just a fan of the brain and somebody that's happy to watch the psychedelic sideshow from the sidelines. In any event, in the main interview for this episode, we're going to be talking with Dr. Robin Carhart Harris, who's one of the lead researchers active now studying the effects of LSD on the brain. If you hang around until the very end of the episode, since uh, we're going to be having a generally positive commentary on an illegal drug, in the Ruthless Listener Retention gimmick, we're going to flip that on its head and give a very stern warning about the misuse of a fully legal over-the-counter medication and why diarrhea medication is best used strictly for diarrhea. That'll be in the Ruthless Listener Retention gimmick, but for right now, let's kick things off as usual with This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts, This Week in Neuroscience. So when talking about the brain, neurons kind of get all the attention most of the time. Your average man on the street probably thinks of the brain as a collection of neurons with maybe some packing material in between, holding those neurons in place. But increasingly, scientists are seeing that other lesser known cell types that get less fanfare are still really involved in the brain's activities. And recently, researchers at the University of Copenhagen and the University of Rochester have shown how cells called astrocytes, by regulating the levels of salts in the cerebrospinal fluid, may be controlling our sleep and wake cycles to a large degree. So the body is made up of cells, as we all know, but there's also extracellular fluids, fluids that different cells might be floating in, suspended in, and these fluids by weight actually make up a huge amount of our body. This is true as well in the brain. And it's been known for a while that the concentrations of various ions in the extracellular fluid outside of brain cells, outside of neurons, change a lot depending on the sleep or wake state of an animal. In particular, the concentration of potassium, calcium, magnesium, and hydrogen ions have all been known to vary depending on whether an animal is awake or asleep. This has been thought previously to be a downstream effect, that something about the sleepiness or lack thereof of the brain or the body is affecting these ion concentrations. But not so, says Professor Macon Nadergaard, who is the lead author of a study that approached this from the opposite direction. They manipulated the concentration of these salts, these ions, in mouse brains and found that by changing the concentrations, they could change the sleeping or the waking state of the animal. So they could put an animal to sleep or wake an animal up by changing the concentrations of salts in its cerebrospinal fluid. The fact that a simple alteration of extracellular ion composition can wake a sleeping animal up and put a waking animal to sleep is direct evidence that this mechanism plays a key role in regulating consciousness. Furthermore, this discovery reveals that studying only neurons is not enough to understand the brain. A research must include all the supportive cells, especially the so-called astrocytes which regulate the levels of these salts in the brain. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast so smart, we have smart in our title, twice. Picked up a couple of five-star reviews on iTunes this past week. Erin Jessu from Australia says, love it. Awesome podcast on smart drugs and all things cognitive health and enhancement related. And Dr. Sherry, also from Australia, says, I've been listening since the get-go and always look forward to the latest release. Well-moderated, edited, and snappy interviews and an intuitive program structure. Well, thank you very much. Thanks to all of you that are spreading the word on Smart Drug Smarts. Heard back from a bunch of people last week, put the little call to arms out about the upcoming water fast week, which is under three weeks away now, getting the uh, the heebie-jeebies, but it's generally a good excitement. Drop me an email if you want to get added to that list. My email is jesse at smartdrugsmarts.com. Also, we'll no doubt be talking about that more in the newsletter, which we put out about once weekly. I mentioned that before, smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter if you want to get signed up for that. And a big thanks also to those of you that have been checking out axonlabs.io. Axon Labs is the retail wing of our operations over here at Smart Drug Smarts, also home to my drug of choice or cognitive stack of choice. 
choice, Nexus, a mix that we put together containing aniracetam, pycnogenol, phosphatidylserine, and CDP choline. By the way, somebody reminded me recently that we really need to get going again with our Know Your Neurotransmitter series of episodes, and acetylcholine is going to be high on the hit list there. If you notice the name similarity between acetylcholine and the Nexus ingredient CDP choline, that is not a coincidence. It is oftentimes considered wise to stack a choline along with the racetam, and that's what we've done with Nexus. A couple of Nexus in my system now, but yeah, if you haven't been there yet, check out axonlabs.io on the web. I think that's all the housekeeping, so let's move along now to the main interview. Smart Drug Smarts. So I'm about to be speaking with Dr. Robin Carhart-Harris. He is part of the Faculty of Medicine at the Imperial College London. And he first came across my radar screen quite a while ago when I was interviewing Professor David Nutt, who's also over in the UK. In that episode, we were talking primarily about bringing some rationality and depoliticizing the way that drugs can be studied. And he mentioned a lot of the LSD research that was getting underway then. I think he had just recently finished a paper with Dr. Carhart-Harris at that time. Anyway, so this conversation was a long time coming, but as you will hear, the main thrust of of Dr. Carhart Harris's research is into psychedelics and their effects on the brain. This is not a short-term research fling for him. He is really taking the psychedelic bull by the horns and trying to get at what the real underlying mechanisms of action are in these compounds that obviously have such profound effects on the human mind. Psychedelics present a whole warren of rabbit holes that one could go down. Lots of different topics, and, and as I found out as I got to really researching this, more to cover here than I wanted to try to wedge into just one episode. So think of this as our LSD episode part one. We're going to have a couple more episodes coming up in the not terribly distant future with some other real luminaries in the psychedelic sciences space. Those ones will be a little bit more hands-on direct applications for those people who are more curious than cautious and want to be trying a psychedelic substance for themselves. This episode is going to be a bit more groundwork, talking a bit about LSD's history, its physical interactions with the brain, and some of the social issues that surround it. So let's jump in now with Dr. Robin Carhart-Harris. People have an experience with something like LSD and they can't quite believe it's possible to have these kind of experiences. It's just hard to fathom until you've really had the experience yourself or at least have sufficient enough of an open mind to listen to the accounts of people who have had an experience with a psychedelic drug, you know, to really appreciate these altered states can occur, that, that it's possible to be as awake as you and I are right now, and yet experience this quality of consciousness that is just fundamentally different. Somebody told me once, talking about psychedelics is like dancing about architecture. It's just like the wrong (laughs) medium for describing it. Yeah, but in a way you could dance about architecture, and I'm sure many artists have probably tried that. So, you know, you look at something like Aldous Huxley's account of his experience with mescaline in The Doors of Perception, and he's capturing it there. I mean, it's become a bit of a platitude that it's entirely indescribable. I mean, at the end of the day, words are all we have, really. And there's so much that's been written about the psychedelic experience that I would say people have captured it, if only to add in that the quality of the experience is such that it is not impossible, but a huge challenge to try and capture it in words, you know, and that its very essence is that it's ineffable, but not to say that it's impossible to capture it in words, just that it's a real challenge. But point being that people can have these incredibly profound experiences with these drugs and then be left thinking, what the hell happened there? And those who have a materialist in the sense of a scientific materialism, if they're of that perspective, then the natural question is, what the hell was going on in my brain? How did my brain activity change in that state? How can it be explained? You know, and for those who come at it from that perspective, there is that very strong sense of wonder. And I suppose in in my case, a large um, degree of, of sort of drive and determination to try and answer that question, really. You know, until very recently, we just haven't had any kind of real sense of what the answers to that question is. What happens in the brain? How does the brain change to account for such an experience as you can have with a psychedelic? I mean, LSD wasn't, in a way, it wasn't the first psychedelic, but in another way it was, because it was only after LSD came on the scene that Humphrey Osmond, a British psychiatrist, in conversation with Aldous Huxley, coined the term psychedelic. So 
in a way, LSD is the prototypical psychedelic. And I think if it wasn't for LSD, obviously the events of of the 50s and 60s wouldn't have happened. But the point is that the same level of excitement and interest, but also hysteria, really, that all wouldn't have happened because of mescaline, because mescaline had been around, well, it's been around for thousands of years. And the same for psilocybe mushrooms as well. And the thing about LSD is it catalyzed the interest in psychedelic compounds and it catalyzed the systematic study of psychedelics. I mean, some scientific work was going on with mescaline around the turn of the 20th century. But it was only really when Hoffman serendipitously, so it seemed, discovered the psychoactive properties of LSD that things really started to happen, you know, in terms of the scientific study of of psychedelics. For people that don't know the history of the invention of LSD, I mean, I know that this is sort of a long and storied history, but maybe if you could give kind of the cartoon version of the discovery up until I think the point that most people have heard about, which is it's getting made illegal. Yeah, well, really, the key events occur around the Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman, who was working for a chemical company then called Sandos and now called um, Novartis. And he was working in Basel in Switzerland and under his supervisor, Arthur Stoll. And he was working on a class of compounds related to ergot, a fungus that grows on certain grasses like rye. And they were looking at chemicals that might alter the behavior of blood vessels related to things like respiration and childbirth as well. So anything that would sort of modulate those things. So they were looking for novel potential pharmaceuticals that might be useful, you know, for applications like controlling bleeding in in childbirth. And this was actually, this was in Nazi-controlled Europe. This was like the early 1940s, right? Yeah, it was 38, actually, when Hoffman was doing his his first stuff. And and the war kind of put a, a bit of a pause on the research that Hoffman was doing. But nevertheless, he had actually synthesized LSD, I think, in 38. But it wasn't until towards the end of the war, I think it was 43, that Hoffman revisited the work that he was doing. He took his, some LSD off the shelf that he'd made and he started, you know, resynthesizing and, and playing around with it. And as the story goes, he accidentally absorbed some through his fingertips. I've talked to some very credible psychedelic scientists who told me that that's impossible and it's a bit of a myth that you can absorb LSD through your skin and trip from it, you know, and he's been working, he's a chemist and has been working with LSD for most of his career. Right. So the the implication is that he must have put a couple of drops in his tongue. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Truly a mad scientist. (laughs) Well, who knows? He also sort of likes to joke that Hoffman was being Swiss would be very, you know, meticulous in his methods and as if he could access accidentally ingest some. So anyway, whatever happened, the story goes that he did accidentally get some into his bloodstream. And then he describes in later accounts, retrospective accounts of of this period, that he felt kind of this not unpleasant intoxication. I think it goes and then he entered this dreamlike state where with eyes closed, he saw a kaleidoscopic play of colors. It's incredibly poetic because these, these, these accounts that Hoffman has written about his experience. So this happened around sort of springtime, I think, in, in 1943. And a couple of days later, because he'd been reflecting on what had happened and thought, you know, something quite special was going on here. I really need to do things properly and and systematically study what's going on. So he weighed up what in his mind would be a incredibly small dose of any kind of drug. Um, It was 200 micrograms of LSD. LSD is so potent that, you know, a dose of LSD is barely visible to the eye. It's just a tiny speck. 200 micrograms is is visible, but, you know, it's just a a few crumbs. So, but Hoffman weighed this up thinking, you know, if this stuff's really toxic, then it's not going to kill me, 200 mics. So he intentionally ingested this 200 mics and he sort of planned everything out, but it was uh, actually, you know, very potent dose of LSD, 200 mics, typical dose that's taken recreationally or that we give in our research is around about 100 mics, so about half Hoffman took. (laughs) So he was tripping balls, as they say, right? and got on his bike and cycled home. And he describes how the journey, gosh, how did it go? That seemed to take forever, I think, he said, but it turned out 
that he was cycling at some speed, his assistant told him later on. This experience wasn't entirely pleasant this time. He described it as being at times nightmarish. He thought he was perhaps going mad, that perhaps he was dying. His neighbor came to check on him and she turned to this malevolent witch and he was suspicious. Yeah. Oh boy. He, yeah, so it wasn't great. But the ironic thing, and I mentioned this paper that we've had published a couple of weeks ago on the paradoxical psychological effects of LSD, that the interesting paradox here is that although he had a tough time, the next day he describes feeling refreshed and he's had a good sleep and he has his breakfast and it tastes better than normal and he feels lighter and like he's been sort of reborn in a way. And and so that title, The Paradoxical Psychological Effects of LSD, is very much related to this paradox that one can have a challenging experience with a psychedelic drug may in some ways resemble a psychotic episode with paranoia, fear and anxiety, sometimes panic. And yet in the aftermath, people can feel somehow lifted and lighter and experience a kind of improvement in their sense of well-being. So that wasn't just a kind of description that has no sort of substance. It, the title for that paper came from some data that we acquired in our research with LSD, where we looked at things like psychotomimetic experiences. That means experiences that mimic or resemble psychosis. So we, we measured whether people were showing psychosis-like symptoms during the acute LSD experience. I'd like to break for a moment just to talk a little bit about dosages. We mentioned that 200 micrograms, rather, yeah. was the initial dose and that that's about twice what people take when they're recreationally using it. Yeah. One thing that, you know, sort of gaining a lot of fanfare, I guess, in the last year or so is people that are using micro doses of LSD, which I, I think is about one tenth of a normal recreational dose for it's sort of like productivity hacking and creative, just sort of trying to uptick people's creativity. I'm yeah. wondering if in the course of your research, if there's a typical like tripwire where something goes beyond just being a creative uptick to, you know, putting a person in the range of having a psychotomimetic episode, like is there sort of a, a danger zone that a person crosses at some you know, microgram threshold? That's a really good question. So the research that we've done at Imperial hasn't looked specifically at that, but I'm aware of a study that's also happening in London where they're looking specifically at microdosing and trying to address just these questions. You know, is there some kind of threshold dose where you go from having a kind of loosening effect on cognition that could also enhance aspects of cognition to a dose where you get things like some confusion or the thought disorder that you associate with psychotic experience. All I can say is that, vaguely speaking, that might be in the domain of something like 50 micrograms, where it stops being something like barely perceptible. You know, your visual perception of things isn't really altered well. But sometimes you hear that even with lower doses of like 20 mics. So one of the really difficult things with psychedelics is the huge variation in people's individual sensitivities to, you know, a given dose of LSD or any other psychedelic. On one of your studies, I saw that basically it was a placebo controlled trial and the people that were receiving the actual dose got 75 micrograms versus, a, I guess, like a saline solution for the placebo. Was there anybody in the trial that didn't register the 75 micrograms? I mean, was there ever any doubt as to who got the doses and who didn't? In the LSD imaging study with 75 mics, everyone feels it, really. That's never a question after they get the 75 mics of LSD. Occasionally, people can be fooled when they receive a placebo. That's something that's generally acknowledged and recognized with placebo in placebo-controlled trials, that it's quite easy to be fooled by something inert. It's harder to be fooled by something active. So, you know, when you're in a depression trial and you get some Prozac or whatever, you tend to know when you're in the Prozac group, if you're in the placebo group, that's when you tend to get this 50 split in terms of uncertainty as people don't know whether they've received the active or the placebo because it's so easy just to invent some effects. Yeah, I would think that anybody that had had any experience with psychedelics probably wouldn't report a false positive. No, that's probably true too, yeah. So... When we do placebo control in our research with psychedelics, it's sort of done by convention as much as anything. Whenever you do a scientific study, you need a control condition. 
because when you do a scientific study, you're asking a question and you need to be able to support it or not. And so you need a control condition. And also by having a control condition, you can control sort of extraneous variables that aren't sort of essential to your key question. So for example, with placebo in an imaging study, you do everything but give people the active drug. So you're controlling everything else, right? You know, you're controlling whether they get an injection. or So sometimes it can feel a little contrived. And recently we've been doing research in depression with psychedelics, with psilocybin in this case, which is magic mushrooms. And again, it's that, that difficult issue. You know, it feels like a bit of a game that we're playing sometimes because it's so obvious when people get something active or all the sort of potential confounds or things that kind of cloud the picture scientifically, things like suggestibility, expectation, both the patient's expectations and the researcher's expectations, all these things that can bias things do come into play because it's just so obvious when someone gets a psychedelic. So, you know, um, the whole value of using a placebo in this kind of research is it's the convention, it's the standard model, it's the gold standard, but it does feel like we're just playing the game in a way sometimes and that maybe a more pragmatic model, a more kind of real world model might be more suitable. But then again, you know, in the case of doing brain imaging research, you do need this clean baseline condition. And so the placebo condition kind of probably the best of a, of a different situation, really. It seems like most of the psychedelic compounds have some public champion or popularizer. It was probably Timothy Leary for LSD and for Magic Mushrooms, Terence McKenna. And like, I find myself wondering because these guys have written and spoken so publicly about their experiences, if people that are sort of late to the party having experiences with these same compounds, the trips that they experience are really probably influenced by expectations set by these people who have popularized the Terence McKenna version of a psilocybin experience or the Timothy Leary version of an acid experience. Do you think that that's a legitimate concern or am I just being weird? I know I think that's true to an extent. I know when Hoffman had his first experience with psilocybin, not many people know, but Hoffman wasn't just the chap who discovered LSD. He also discovered psilocybin. He identified it in the mushroom material and was also the first to synthesize it. And when he did that and ingested it for the first time, he described these kind of Aztec experiences, knowing that the mushrooms that he'd extracted the psilocybin from that he took came from Central America. And I think that priming is a major aspect of the psychedelic experience, as is suggestibility, which is essentially you know, the same thing, really. So psychological expectations very much influence our actual experiences with the drug. So in a way that that's kind of that can be a problem. But and this is actually a classic kind of issue in the science of psychedelics, as far as I can see, is this question of how much of the psychedelic experience or any person's psychedelic experience is determined by prior psychological material, whether they be recent ways of thinking like day residues with dreams, you know, things that you've been thinking about recently, your, your expectations and them coloring your experience, or even things that are deeper in the psyche than color the experience. It's a really interesting one. And such a hard thing to study. You can't even think of how you would design that experiment. Yeah, well, that's a real challenge. Because on the other, the flip side, another way to look at it is that under a psychedelic, you can experience spontaneous insight about things, you know, a new, fresh way of looking at things that seems fundamentally true sometimes, like the revelation of a very deep and profound and transcendent truth, you know, maybe it's a, a feeling of connectedness or something like that. And then you can imagine a skeptic coming in and saying, well, how much of that is real, genuine, like veridical insight and how much of it is to do with the fact that they had sitters with them who sort of embody that perspective themselves and encourage it. And so I tend to think that it's it's a bit of both, but I do, I have come to believe, and this is really through the therapeutic work that we've done with psychedelics, that there are these genuine revelations that occur, and they might be revelations about the person's own background, their personal history, fresh insights on relationships, 
say with their parents or whatever, loved ones. Is it not true that Francis Crick, one of the co-discoverers of the double helix structure of DNA, was on an acid trip when he came up with the epiphany of what the structure actually was? Yeah, it looks as though there's that's a myth. Sorry to disappoint ah, you. Yeah, it's yeah. A, myth, a myth that's made the rounds then. I've, I've read that it in a really lot of different has. places. Absolutely, yeah. Now, what does seem highly likely is that Crick had used LSD, but there isn't any evidence that LSD use was critical in his discovery of the double helix. So he had used LSD and there was some LSD use going on at Cambridge, people using it as a way to facilitate creative thinking. So there does seem to be some foundation to that. There are other cases. I mean, you can think of Kerry Mullis, who said explicitly his insight about PCR, you know, how to read. Oh, polymerase chain reaction. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. For which he won the Nobel Prize his insight on that was actually occurred during an LSD trip. He said he could literally see the DNA sort of unraveling, you know, before his eyes and saw how he, he could then read it. So although everyone loves, uh, you know, obviously Crick and Watson's discovery was pretty massive in the history of science. PCR isn't that far off. It really isn't. I mean, it's revolutionized biology in the past 20 years. And then you think of technology and you think of Steve Jobs and what he said about LSD, that it was one of the most important things he did in his life. Well, yeah, I don't think that there's many people that have used LSD that would go on record as saying that it doesn't cause a boost to creativity. Yeah, well, that's, this is the big question, isn't it? And as we stand, there isn't any any compelling evidence that is true. It sits in this realm of supposition, really, that people do believe this to be the case, but it hasn't been demonstrated yet. And so it's sort of incumbent on me as someone who is researching uh, psychedelics to make that statement, actually, just to keep people's feet on the ground. Because although it seems true, it hasn't been demonstrated yet. What do we know about the mechanism of action for LSD within the brain? LSD, like other classic psychedelic drugs, psilocybin, DMT in ayahuasca, they all share the property of stimulating a particular aspect of the serotonin systems. Serotonin is an important brain chemical involved in a range of different important functions in the body and in the brain, controlling things like sleep, so controlling conscious states, controlling mood. We know the association between serotonin and mood, that kind of broadly speaking, the People are aware that high levels of serotonin is generally good for mood. So more serotonin in the synapse like you would get with a drug like MDMA or ecstasy and people feel really good. And then there's this association between low serotonergic signaling or broadly speaking, low serotonin in the synapse, let's say in the brain and low mood like you'd get in depression. Anyway, serotonin is involved in a range of different things. One of these things is cognition as well or thinking. And there's a particular serotonin receptor. So these receptors are things, they're proteins that are stuck on the membrane of brain cells. This one's the serotonin 2A receptor. And these particular receptors seem to be important for modulating, well, consciousness. We know that through psychedelics, really. And when they are activated, when they're stimulated by a ligand, which is anything that, that stimulates the receptor, naturally that is the endogenous ligand, that is serotonin. Its receptors are there for serotonin. But what uh, happens when you introduce a psychedelic is you're introducing a chemical which kind of pretends in a way to be serotonin. And psychedelics are special really in having a high affinity or a high stickiness, if you want, for these serotonin 2A receptors. And what's special about the serotonin 2A receptors? Well, there's lots of serotonin receptors. There's about 14 that have been identified. They all do slightly different things. Actually, sometimes they do quite very different things, opposing things. One serotonin receptor might do one thing that another serotonin receptor might counteract. And but what's special about the serotonin 2A receptor? Well, it seems to be involved in processes related to plasticity. And what things are important in relation to plasticity? Well, learning, memory, thinking, cognition, working things out. And a bit more specifically, what do they do? Well, they seem to enhance these processes of plasticity or change, and that could enable things to be learnt more easily, perhaps. It could also enhance a flexibility of thinking if there's plasticity. I'm glad that we started talking about this. Plasticity, I think, in the brain is something that most people are familiar with, but you might not have an idea of whether this is a quick or a long process. 
process is plasticity something that happens over the course of hours, days, months. An LSD trip is typically 10 to 15 hour range. So are we really seeing structural brain changes during that time? Well, this is another thing. If you look at animal research, there is evidence that there are lasting longer term changes with psychedelics. So there are these markers of neuronal growth that are enhanced. They're increased, these markers, after the introduction of a, of a psychedelic compound that's been shown in animals. The effect is really concentrated and strongest in the cortex which is the part of the brain that you most associate with cognition or thinking. And so you see a doubling of this particular marker, this BDNF marker. So that's quite a big thing. And yeah, so it's suggesting that potentially you could get new actual connections. You know, we're not just talking about sort of plasticity and the dynamics during the trip itself. The implication is that there are changes, there are perhaps new connections that are enduring after an experience. And that fits the psychology of the psychedelic experience. Yes, you have this state that is fluid, that is hyper associative, that is sort of dreamlike and imagination is vivid and weird and perception is distorted and things are warped but also you have this interesting afterglow this sort of residue that seems to last after the acute effects have worn off after the trip has subsided where people feel and perhaps even behave differently they might report feeling an improvement in their sense of well-being. Maybe they report a boost in their productivity and their creative drive. And this isn't just something that exists in that important, but nevertheless, slightly flimsy from a scientific perspective, anecdotal space. This is something that has scientific support now. So there is data to suggest that people are changed after psychedelic experiences. Things like personality are changed. Yeah. So I guess the question is, like, how are people going to color that finding? You could see on the one hand, people say, hey, there are positive changes that people feel better. There must have been an improvement. Other people will say, oh, well, the brain's been permanently changed. That must be brain damage. It just kind of depends on what sort of a spin somebody might be looking to put on it. It does. Absolutely. I think it would be a challenge for even the harshest critic. Well, they would just be wrong, actually, to say that increases in, in cortical BDNF could be construed as damage. Right. You're actually seeing the growth of new and neural connections. So now around the psychology, it's interesting. And there will, there will be people who want to spin it negatively, just as there will be people who will want to or will find themselves being a bit uncritical in their positive regard, you know, slightly romanticizing the experience. So I think both camps have to be a little bit conscious of themselves. So, you know, people might think of personality change in relation to psychedelic use and, and think that people are turned on taking psychedelics for the first time. They're all going to become kind of disorganized hippies or something. And I think the challenge is to address that. And if it's wrong and if it's unfair, actually, I think that perspective would be unfair to... It's hard to paint Steve Jobs as a disorganized hippie. Absolutely. Yeah, Richard Branson would be another. You know, there's a, a lot of people who get a kind of real drive and, and get up and go. And, you know, think of things like, I mean, we're looking at psilocybin in depression now. Depression is an incredibly debilitating disorder. Yeah. People who are in the throes of a very deep depression just don't get out of bed in the morning. You know, they're not behaving normally. They're in this pathological state. And if that can be lifted by a psychedelic, then it'd be hard to construe that in a negative way. So, yeah, I think how it's framed is very important. We're looking at measures at the moment with a view to forthcoming studies we're looking at how we can improve our measures of creative thinking, things like social conscience, I suppose, you know, altruism, altruistic thinking. So things that people are going to be changed by psychedelics worth thinking whether these changes are good or bad. And I mean, we've yet to implement these measures, but there is one eye on, on the potential outcome. There has to be always. And perhaps, you know, if things like community mindedness, say, or a very interesting one is nature relatedness. If we think about the sort of issues that humans are faced with 
and the whole of the world are faced with everything that nature's faced with today. If we think about, you know, environmental matters, climate change and such like, then there's not really anything bigger than that. So if we can look at measures of, of say, nature relatedness, which is basically how much you value and feel connected to nature. And well, the hypothesis we hold is that that feeling, that sentiment is actually going to be enhanced, potentially as a consequence of a psychedelic experience, the way the mind is changed, perhaps the way the brain has changed. And if that is the case, then again, it's very difficult to construe that in a negative way if people are beginning to care about the environment more. It's interesting that the psychedelics do seem to have like a political slant to them in a way that like something like alcohol, you've got people on all ends of the political spectrum and every culture in the world enjoy alcohol to one extent or another. It doesn't seem to like lean right, lean left, lean liberal, lean conservative. I don't know whether this is people that are socially liberal being more interested in psychedelics or people that are interested in psychedelics becoming more socially liberal in the wake of that. But there certainly does seem to be sort of a political slant to this class of compounds. Do you have any thoughts on that, why that might be? Well, I think that's one of the most interesting things to address at the moment. The question of the causality, you know, whether it's psychedelic use causing, let's say, liberalism or liberalism preempting an interest in psychedelics and, and then psychedelic use is, a, is an interesting question. It's probably a circular causality. Usually when we're faced with these dilemmas, these sort of chicken and egg kind of dilemmas, one solution to, to that problem is to think of causality in a circular way where it both influence each other. And I think the reason why they are a dilemma is that we tend to think in this sort of linear way that one thing does have to come before the other. But more address this point, what could be underlying that? So my own feeling is that there is a causal relationship that, you know, you take someone who's never taken a, a psychedelic before, they have a certain way of looking at the world and themselves and everything else. And after taking the psychedelic, that, that way of looking at the world and themselves has changed. What's changed, you know, is it just a psychological thing? I think everything that's psychological has a biological counterpart. And again, that causality problem, you can overcome that by thinking of the causality being circular, that brain and, and mind interact. But yes, I, I do believe that there is something causal going on there. I do believe, and I'd want to test this hypothesis that psychedelics do breed, let's be even stronger about it, do cause liberal thinking. Yeah, it's a provocative statement, regardless of how you feel about it. That's just interesting if it's true. Yeah, I know. And so it leads you to think what underlies liberal thinking in terms of the biology. Right. I mean, people have very thoroughly described the psychology of it as they have the psychedelic experience. But Again, what about that big unknown? What about that, that kind of void, that intellectual void that we could fill? And my feeling would be that, again, it's something about more flexible dynamics. You know, it's about the activity being more free flowing, perhaps. Yeah, lots of interesting things to address. And of course, it raises interesting ethical issues as well, you know. What about free will? If you can change people's perspectives via a chemical agent, is that something to be welcomed or is that something to be feared? We, we always think of our political perspectives as having been come upon through our own volition. And we've read our newspapers and we've made our decisions. And so this almost challenges that. And then it sort of forces us to ask questions about what's right then. If people are being kind of changed in this fundamental way, you know, perhaps they're behaving in a more, who knows, for some people looking in, say a conservative observer looking in, they might see a change that they don't think is welcome. You know, the classic Timothy Leary is not just turn on, tune in, this dropout thing. If a conservative critic could look in and think, well, that dropping out of, of society and of a conventional way of being, that's dangerous, that could threaten the integrity of standard way of living. So they'll construe that in a negative way, but then a, a more liberal-minded person would looking at that kind of change and perhaps think these individuals or this individual is thinking more openly now, more creatively. 
and there's more tolerance perhaps in their perspective and behavior. It all depends still where you ascribe the value, but it's lots of interesting things around that, yeah. I can't think of anybody that I've come across personally or that I can think of in like sort of the media sphere that has actually had psychedelic experiences personally that feels like they should be illegal. I know that there are plenty of people that feel like they should be illegal that have never touched this stuff, but are you aware of anybody who has actually experimented with psychedelics themselves that feel like they should not be used? If ever I hear someone say, oh, but I've taken LSD and it was a forgettable experience, nothing really happened, then I think, well, they probably took a dud or they didn't take enough or because that's such an enormous <laughs> It's like saying, I went to the moon and I just wasn't that into it. Yeah, exactly. And uh, Or others say, well, I had LSD experience and it was nightmarish and horrible and I don't want to go there again. Actually, I did hear someone, he's quite a sort of well-spoken He's like a TV host in the UK. So anyway, I'd read in the paper that, of course, he'd been spiked with LSD and had had this nightmarish experience and his wife had to rush into hospital and it was horrible. And I've spoken with plenty of people that have had bad psychedelic experiences and have said, I never want to touch this stuff again. But th- typically that doesn't extend to other people. It's, it's not like this should be barred from all humanity, but just yeah. that's too scary for me personally to truck with. Yeah, well, that's true. And even people who see value in psychedelics may describe having had bad experiences themselves with them. I say bad experiences, challenging experiences that include some period of darkness, say, some period of, let's call it a sort of nightmarish, dysphoric experience. That's actually, you know, it's quite common and it happens in our therapeutic work, but I don't think it necessarily determines negative outcomes. Again, right. that brings us back to that paper that we have published recently on the paradoxical effects of LSD. Hoffman described a nightmare when he took that. I think it was actually 250 mics, so more than I was saying earlier. So yeah, he described a nightmare. Yet the next day, he said he felt really good. I mean, even scarier for him because those of us who come in the wake of him, it's like we know that eventually, if you just wait it out, you'll come back to normal. It's like he had no way of knowing. Yes, absolutely. And actually, I think there's something important in the early work with psychedelics when you look at the quality of people's experiences, because coming back to the question you asked earlier about priming and so much has been said about psychedelics now that when somebody has an experience is their experience going to be so thoroughly colored by what's been said and written about previously about psychedelics can they have a fresh experience that that's theirs you know but i think if you go back to hoffman's account there's that kind of freshness he was essentially the first person to have an LSD experience. So I think there's something important in those accounts and so something quite authentic, really, when you hear about something that was challenging, difficult, but also later on the next day, seemingly quite positive. I actually think another aspect of psychedelics, which is sort of advantageous in a way in terms of if these compounds are going to be utilized, whether as therapeutics, as medicines, or as sort of tools for the exploration of the mind. One thing that's useful is that these drugs aren't Moorish. They're not things that people typically want to revisit anytime soon after having an experience with them. So unlike a lot of drugs and a lot of legal drugs, they don't have much of a addiction potential, if any. Right. You know, animals won't self-administer these compounds. They don't like them. So that says quite a lot, I think. Smart Drug Smarts. So thank you so very much to Dr. Robin Carhart-Harris for taking the time for that interview. I think I've said this before, and I will admit it. As an American, I cannot help but attribute like an extra 20 points of IQ to anybody that has that perfect Queen's English British accent that Dr. Carhart-Harris does. So in addition to great information, there was just a pleasure to listen to him talk. I thought it was really interesting, some of the musings at the ending there, about whether psychedelics might promote socially liberal thinking. It's pretty much accepted conventional wisdom nowadays that the war on drugs started in large part as a way of cracking down on the political discord in the U.S. around the Vietnam War, and politicians at the time seeing that there was a large overlap between people that were political opponents and fans of psychedelic drugs. And although that certainly seems like a politically cynical, opportunistic kind of move, it's interesting to think that there might actually be some logic to that, that the use of these substances might actually be pushing people even further into what would have been the rival political camp at that point. Anyway, really interesting topic. Like I said, a a thicket of really interesting topics around psychedelics. We'll be back for more a few episodes from now, so don't think you've heard the last of this. But for now, let's move along to the ruthless listener retention gimmick. 
Smart Drug Smarts, ruthless listener retention gimmick. So we just had a generally positive conversation there about LSD, which is an illegal drug, as you know. So as a counterpoint to that, to kind of keep things balanced, I figured it would be good to have a ruthless listener retention gimmick that stresses the dangers of the misuse of drugs. And in this case, because this is a show about benefiting your brain, one of the best things you can do for your brain is to not die. And of somewhat lesser importance, but still worth mentioning, is that it would be really, really embarrassing to die by an overdose on diarrhea medication. But this is something that does happen, and unfortunately it's happening with increasing regularity. You may be familiar with the -the over-the-counter brand Emodium AD. The AD stands for anti-diarrheal, and Emodium is a brand name for the generic drug Loperamide. Now what you might not have known, hopefully you didn't, is that Loperamide in the body activates some of the same receptors that are stimulated by the opioid drugs like heroin. And at high doses, much higher than is used to treat diarrhea, it can produce feelings of euphoria, and some people, because of its easy over-the-counter availability and cheap price, have been using it not for diarrhea, but either to get high or to at least alleviate some of the physical symptoms of opiate withdrawals. Apparently, the minimum effective dose for getting high from loperamide is something like 10 times the minimum effective dose for the treatment of diarrhea, so people are taking a whole lot more of this stuff than they ought to be, and obviously for a far different reason. A poison control center in New York State said that they've seen a sevenfold increase in calls related to loperamide poisoning in the last four years, and people have been dying as a result of occasional overdose. So two lessons here. Number one, don't use diarrhea medication recreationally. And number two, continue to be highly skeptical of how drugs are legally classified. When something like LSD is a Schedule 1 narcotic and something like loperamide can be bought over the counter by any 12-year-old with a couple of bucks, you know that we've got a seriously wonky system. We like to think of ourselves as a digital speakeasy for brain hackers, but you can call us Smart Drug Smarts. Okay, you heard it. That is the entire episode at number 129. These numbers just keep getting bigger. If uh, if you enjoyed this episode, we will have it online, along with links to everything that we talked about here at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 129. Last week in episode 128, if you missed that one, we talked with Dr. Anders Ericsson about expertise and how to get more of it in your life and in your brain. And next week, we're going to be talking about chocolate. Yes, chocolate and its effects on your brain, which are not to be discounted. So come back for that. If you're looking for something to do to keep yourself busy in the meantime, telling a couple of friends about Smart Drug Smarts is always much appreciated. Social media is always useful, but chalk drawings on sidewalks or anything like that, creative things of a more homespun bent are equally welcome. One last reminder, we've got that Smart Drug Smarts newsletter at smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter. Think seriously about signing up for that. As for me, I'll be back at you next Friday, same time, same podcast, and with the same unflagging commitment to helping you fine-tune the performance of your own brain. So have a great week and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smarts should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.